Today's topic is about money. Did you know that if you look at all the parables of the Lord Jesus, he spoke more about money than anything else. Jesus, I repeat, he spoke more about money than about anything else in all his parables. That means that money is a big issue in the kingdom of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Today's topic, I repeat, is how to handle a dollar, money. I want you to turn to the pastor's corner on the back of your bulletin, and we are going to address this very, very crucial issue right away. Let us read together or just follow along with me silently these quotes. I'll probably read not all of them, but the first few of them. Beginning with Bruce Wilkinson's quote, When you serve God, you are using God's money to accomplish His wishes. But when you serve money, you are using God's money to accomplish your wishes. Second quote by Mother Teresa. Money is useful, but the love, the attention, and the care we offer to others are the most important things. Third quote by a very well-known famous writer, Charles Ryrie. How we use our money demonstrates the reality of our love for God. In some ways, it proves our love more conclusively than depth or knowledge, length of prayers, or prominence of service. These things can be feigned or fake, but the use of our possessions shows us up for what we actually are. Next quote. We love money simply for the approval, self-esteem, and value it brings. It makes us important. It provides an outlet. Money quenches our ego for a moment, but leaves us thirsty for more. I'll end the reading with what Gordon MacDonald said. The writer of Proverbs point out that when character and maturity are absent, the destructive force of money erupts, and the potential good of that inheritance is squandered, spent recklessly, invested unwisely, lost swiftly, not blessed. Right there, we got the main essence of our message from this famous Christian leaders and writers in the church. So let's look at the uh, story of a widow in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. A widow who was so blessed by God that God moved her up from financial shortage to financial surplus through God's miraculous intervention. Say with me, from financial shortage to financial surplus. Is that what you want? That's what we all want. Am I correct? Am I the only one? Be honest with me. All of us want that, right? Okay. Let's look at the text. 2 Kings 4, verses 1 to 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered. I look at the dictionary for the meaning of revered. It simply means loved deeply, respected greatly. You know he revered my husband, my dead husband, revered the Lord. But now, his creditor is coming to take my two boys 
as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. That is her dollar. A little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. And as such, and as it is filled, put it to one aside. She left him. And afterward, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept on pouring. You see the miracle happening right now? Verse 6. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Look at verse 7. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. As we all know, money or the economy is the number one issue in this coming presidential election. That's no secret. We all know that by now. The big question is how to pay our national debt of $19 trillion, which could be $20 trillion after our president is done with the White House. Did you know that right now, our government is paying $1.2 billion of interest per day? Per day. If you combine all the federal debts incurred by all the presidents from Washington to today, the government incurred more debts in the last eight years than in the last 240 years. So we are facing a huge challenge economically as a nation. We need God's intervention to turn around our U.S. economy that affects all of us. The answer is not a politician. The answer is God. Actually, whoever wins between these two candidates, Clinton and Trump, they will inherit that much debt. They need your prayers and my prayers. Amen? Hallelujah. From our text, we learn that financial and family stress could come even to people who revere or love God and respect God deeply. Just because you are a prophet, or a pastor, or an evangelist, or a deacon, or a very spiritual person, you are not exempt from possibly experiencing financial stress or distress. That is what we read in the text. So this message will address the question, if this happens to you and me, which it could, what shall we do? What shall we do? In our text, the widow's problem, her faith, and her miracle can give us practical insights on how to cope with financial stress and family stress, which are, by the way, interrelated. You know that. We all know that. Family stress sometimes stems from financial stress. So financial stress and family stress are most of the time, interrelated. So if and when God, by his sovereign decree or will, allows any of us to go through financial stress and distress, what should we do? Okay? So let's look at the problem of the widow. Her problem is already stated. Her husband is dead. Those of you who just lost your husband, a few years ago, you are still probably depressed over the loss of your husband. Unless you hated your husband, I don't know. I mean, 
I'm just joking. <laughs> and to make this even worse, the husband's creditor wants to take her two sons as his slaves, which was practiced in the Old Testament. In those days, legally, a creditor is allowed to take your sons to pay your unpaid debt. Okay? And to make it even worse, this widow had nothing, had nothing except what? A little oil. A little oil. Now, the question follows, how did this widow react to her family and financial stress and distress? This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it applies to you and me right now. How did she react to her family and financial stress? Did she blame herself for marrying a poor prophet? Did she say, I should have been wiser than marry a poor prophet? I don't think so. I don't think she said that. Did she allow herself to sink into self-pity and deep depression? It doesn't look like it. Did she blame God for taking her husband? I don't think so. Did she quit loving and trusting God? No. Instead, my friends, she cried out, say, cried out. To whom? To the government? No. She cried out to prophet Elisha. She cried out. Okay, in counseling, I have learned what they call catharsis. If you are full of stress and distress, mental stress and distress, it may be good for you to, just to cry out. If there is no one to cry out to, get in your room, lock it up, and just cry out to God. That will help you release or relieve you of some of your tension and your stress. But this widow cried out to the right person. She cried out to a prophet, Elisha, maybe the greatest miracle-working prophet following uh, Elijah. And this prophet advised her what to do. Amen? Okay, now, let me just point out to you. The prophet Elisha didn't have a PhD in clinical psychology or psychological counseling or psychiatric counseling. But probably she had a doctor of divinity in faith counseling. I'm just, you know, using these terms to connect with you. Prophet Elisha gave her what kind of counseling? Faith counseling on how to solve her financial problem. Let's go to the next point. Her faith. The widow's faith. Verses 3 to 5. Let's describe her faith. First of all, her faith was obedient. Say obedient. She obeyed Prophet Elisha's instruction to ask all her neighbors for many empty jars to be filled with her little oil. Now, I want you to imagine here. If you were in her shoes, would you do that? That could be very embarrassing. You get to talk to all your neighbors and you say, may I have your empty jars? What for? Oh, my prophet is telling me that his God will fill up all my empty jars with oil. Probably her neighbor said, are you crazy? Okay. This widow obeyed Elisha's instruction to, next, go inside. Go inside. Shut the door and pour your oil into the empty jars, which was her faith in action that produced her miracle. You want to see a miracle in your life? Whatever God tells you to do, put it into action. Amen? Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then, when all the jars were full, the widow reported the miracle to prophet Elisha. And the prophet continued his faith counseling by saying, go and sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your son will live on what is left. 
Okay, get this. Very interesting. This is how to handle a dollar. This is how to handle a dollar. Are you listening? Okay. So you have very little dollars, few dollars. Now you have a lot of dollars. What do you do with your dollars? Pay your debts first and be debt free. That's what the prophet counsel her to do. Right? She didn't forget the creditor. She went to the creditor and paid the creditor to keep him from taking her sons. How to handle a dollar? Don't get crazy when you suddenly become a millionaire. If you are in debt, pay off your debts. Is that sound? Amen. Counseling? Yes. Okay. Hallelujah. Now, pastoral or biblical counseling will tell you what is right to do first before you can feel good about yourself. No amount of pastoral or biblical counseling will help you if you don't follow this principle. I've been doing some counseling now and probably uh, I'll do something else about that uh, because I'm so, so swamped with work uh, here in the church. But here is a principle that all of us who need counseling must remember. If we are not do, if we're willing to do what is right first, all the following counseling sessions will not help us. A lot of times we know what to do. We are not just doing it. Right? We, we'll just be wasting our time and the pastor's time. So whatever God tells us in the counseling, put it in practice, and then you will see God work. Amen? Okay. I'm talking to myself here, not just to you. Hallelujah. Like the widow, let us translate our faith into action. Like the widow, let us translate our faith into action. What was the action? She went and borrowed the jars from her neighbors. That was the action. To begin with, she had the faith that God would do something miraculous, but she put faith to her action. I should say to her faith. Amen? Now, when the widow poured her little oil into one jar at a time, all the jars were filled. That was the miracle. Finally, this is a short message. Let's look at the widow's miracle, verses 4 to 7. The widow's miracle. Using her little oil as her capital, say capital. This widow was blessed by God with an oil business. Did you see that? Her little oil was multiplied by God that now she had a business. We call it oil business. She was now the supplier of oil for the whole town or city or maybe province. Can you imagine that? From financial shortage to financial surplus for a no business to a big business. Do you want to see that happen in your life? I want that to happen to all of you business people. Amen? Hallelujah. But first, what do we need to do? Put feet to our faith. Amen? Okay, so that the miracle will take place. I don't know what kind of business you have, but this just happens to be an oil business. There are so many businesses in America uh, going on today. What, whatever your business is, as small as it is to begin with probably right now, but it can quadruple and just keep on going and progressing and prospering as you follow the Lord. Amen? Now, there's something special that I want you to look at verse 7. The oil stopped flowing when all the jars were full. The oil stopped flowing when all the jars were full. Right? What is the scoop, young people say? The scoop is here. The size of our miracle depends on the size of our faith in God. Say it to yourself. Say it back to me. The size of our miracle depends on the size of our faith in God. Not just God, our faith in God. Because God is limitless in what He can do. But what limits God as far as dealing with us is our faith. 
So the size of our miracle depends on the size of our faith in God. You know what I think? If the widow borrowed more empty jars as God instructed her, she could have had more oil. Right? Okay. God will keep pouring his oil of blessing as long as we present to him our empty jars, believing that he will fill them all. Amen? If I'm excited, uh, there's a reason for it. Because I've seen this work in my life and in your life, many of you. Basically, the jars we need to bring to God or the vessels we need to bring to God are three, among other things. The jar or the vessel of desire, say desire. The burning desire to see God's provisions to be poured into our lives and into our ministries. There must be a desire. A desire is more than just a wish. You can wish, 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 and then you forget the wish. But a burning desire will not let you rest until what you desire comes into fruition. So we present to God our jar of what? Desire to see God's provisions to be poured into our lives, our families, and our ministries. The second jar or vessel is the vessel of faith. Say faith that believes God for the supernatural work He could do in and through our lives. Amen? Okay. The third jar or vessel is the vessel of obedience to do whatever God wants us to do for His glory and for the benefit of others. Now, speaking of desire, speaking of faith, speaking of obedience, These are the jars or vessels that my wife and I have presented to the Lord to start our church 29 years ago. The vessel of desire, the vessel of faith, and the vessel of obedience. So, uh, just to review, those of you who are new, you'll know the story. What brought my wife and me Back from our missionary assignment in Singapore to start our church 29 years ago are the following. First, our burning desire to build a multi-ethnic church in California. It was a burning desire. Why would I exchange a very lucrative and uh, prestigious position being president of Asia Theological Center for Missions and return to the States with nothing? Why would I do that? My friends say, you're crazy. 48 years old? You return to California with 10 people? How how are you going to build a church with 10 people? I was on the staff of a 5,000-member church in Singapore, besides being the president of the school, and then just walk away from that? What made me do that? It was my burning desire, my burning desire to build a multi-ethnic church in California. Secondly, our faith to see these 10 people, which were actually our friends, the original group of Christmas Life Church, to grow into a big church. Growing 10 people to a big church is very, very difficult to do in the U.S., especially in California, right? Now, it was our obedience to God to do whatever it takes to build a big church from scratch. It was our obedience to God to do whatever it takes to build a big church from scratch. And guess what? God granted our desire. God rewarded our faith. And God blessed our obedience. That's why you and I are here today. Amen? Glory to God for that. 29 years later, actually this coming October, it will be 30 years later, we now have 700 plus active adherents who attend our church at least twice a month. And we now have 500 plus in average weekend attendance. And our property, uh, the whole property we own, is assessed at at least $9 $9 million. 
I know that because before that big building there was completed, our property was already assessed at $5.5 million. And the actual dollar amount our church spent for that brand new building is $4 million. So if you put the two figures together, our property is worth more than $9 million. And we're supporting 38 missionaries and missions organizations around the world. That's a big uh, investment of your money. Actually, if you're asking how much do we give to missions or for missions, at least 10% or more of our general income is used for local and world missions. Give God a big clap offering for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the widow's story in our, in our text inspires and challenges us to do the following, and I close with this. To trust God to supply our needs as individuals and as a church, even in these very difficult times in America. To handle the dollars he entrusts to us as individuals and as a church with utmost care for his glory. You know, as devout Christians, you and I, you and I, listen to me, you and I, have no right to say, this is my money. I spend it the way I want to spend it. I use it wherever I want to use it because I earn this. No, if you say that, you don't understand what it means to be a Christian. Because when you and I became a Christian, Christ became our Lord. And if he's our Lord, he's Lord over everything. Our time, our money, our health, our family, whatever. Right? Okay, so... We're talking about how to handle a dollar. If as a Christian, I cannot handle a dollar, how can I handle a million dollars? God is very eager to bless all of us with more and more and more if we can manage it properly without corrupting us. Right? If you ask God, he wants all of you to become millionaires or maybe billionaires like Trump. But may I submit to us this morning, there is a need for proper teaching in the body of Christ about stewardship. Just because I, I am the one who earns my dollars uh, uh, doesn't give me the right to just spend it here and there, wherever I want to, whenever I want to, because that's not my dollars. That belongs to God, right? Okay. So, uh, you know this woman didn't say, hey, hey prophet, now I'm wealthy, I have an oil business, I'll just do whatever I want to do with my money. No, 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 no. Pay your debts first and live on what is left. That is how you handle your dollars. That's how I, I, I handle my dollars. Amen? Don't let your dollars handle you. You handle your dollars. Amen? Okay. Thirdly, Use our dollars to spread the gospel worldwide and make more disciples among all nations. We already said that. That's our mission as a church. And advance together to win more people to Christ. The gospel is free. You know that, right? But propagating the gospel is not free. The gospel is free. But propagating the gospel is very expensive, especially now in America, right? I, I should like to encourage all of us with these two sentences I'm about to uh, say. God, who miraculously blessed and finance, the financially distressed widow, is the same God we believe in and serve today. Okay, you might, you might talk back to me and say, Pastor Fred, you don't know how stressed and distressed I am at this time. Sure, I don't know, because I don't know all of your stories. But this is what I know from this story. Are you more distressed and stressed than this widow? She lost her husband. She was about to lose her two sons. She had nothing except a little oil. I don't think anyone here is in that position today. We're in America. 
But what I'm trying to impress upon our hearts today is no matter how serious your personal situation looks like to you today, the God who helped this widow is the same God who can help you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Amen. So what do we need to do? Just in case, just in case you are an uh, individual, you are a family uh, that's now facing some uh, stress and distress because of your financial or family stresses, present your case to God. Present your case to God. Don't allow your distress and stress sink you into depression and kill you with a heart attack or high diabetes or sugar count in your blood. Why? Because the God of the widow is your God and my God. Let's all stand up. Hallelujah. Praise God.